Hello and welcome to the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host Will and today I'm joined by Lee Storey to discuss marine science's net zero ambitions and what it means for ocean observations. Hi Lee, thanks for joining me. Good morning and thank you. All right, so with a previous guests we usually start with a random ocean question. So your question is, if you could relive one experience at sea, what would it be? Um, I am going to um, use a really recent experience um, I had the opportunity over Christmas, um, just gone, to join the uh, Royal Research Ships to David Attenborough uh, down in uh, the Falkland Islands and then spent five and a half weeks going around British Antarctic Survey's infrastructure, um, their main station uh, at Rothera, which is on Adelaide Island, part of the uh, Antarctic Peninsula. And then we went to one of the other stations, Sydney Island, then to Bird Island, South Georgia, got to visit uh, Ernest Shackleton's um, grave, so you know, a boyhood hero. Um, a couple of times across the Drake Passage, which is this legendary, you know, body of water down there. Uh, um, interact with the scientists down there. Look at the new ship. It was my first time on the Sir David Attenborough. It's an amazing research ship. Um, uh, so, you know, as an experience, uh, that was fantastic. And, and and actually, I hope to go and do it again. Um, seeing antarctica uh you know just um the the constantly changing um scenery with icebergs and the wildlife and you'd see the the whales and the, you know, the pods of whales pop up uh, and then you get close to the land and you start to see the seals uh swimming around and the penguins yeah. um the albatross and and you know you 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 hear about this um bird and and the fact that it you know it, it it leaves land and doesn't come back for for months and months at a time and the majesty of the albatross and then you see it gliding around and past the ship in 40 50 knot winds uh totally at home in that environment and they are truly truly amazing yeah so huge privilege and, and just an amazing experience so on to the main subject then so the term net zero i'm sure a lot of our listeners have probably heard net zero in the news and not online are you able to just give us sort of an introduction as to what is meant by the term net zero? Yeah, of course, I'll try. Um, although actually I'm going to outsource part of the answer. Um, there's a chap called Professor uh, Johan Rockström, who's the director of the Potsdam uh, Center for Climate Research. Um, he's done loads of podcasts and presentations. Um, uh, do an internet search for him and he'll describe it uh, in, in its global sense way better than I can and he's really good. I'll pick up one point that he makes uh, repeatedly which I think is important is that one and a half degrees uh, is not a target it's not a goal it's a limit um, and that's important we've got to you know remind ourselves that there's a real imperative here to, to make these changes uh, and if we miss that limit of one and a half degrees we set in train changes uh, to, to, to the earth um, that may be difficult to to get back. Um, Closer to home, uh, you know, I've always been hugely impressed that UKRI wrote a sustainability strategy a few years ago, said we will be net zero by 2040, which is 10 years ahead of, you know, uh, uh, government policy and that sort of thing. Uh, that was a brave thing to do. I think it was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, what does it mean then? Um, well, the way I interpret it is the vast majority of UKRI activity, and by that then you mean NERC activity and you mean NOC activity, will have to shift to zero carbon uh, based uh, infrastructure and, and operations and um, you allow yourself this net zero um, phrase because given that challenging time frame given the difficulty of some of the uh, activities uh, responding in that time frame to, to the challenge of a new fuel source and how it will work and how the global logistics will allow it um, you know, you've got to give yourself a little bit of leeway here, particularly when, you know, NERC operate in Antarctica, which is a long way away and it's a relatively, you know, it can be a dangerous place or the middle of the ocean. So so you give yourself this little bit of leeway. Um, but if you look at some of the investments going on in the buildings that, that NERC and UKRI own and the solar panels that are going in, you know, you can start to see that there'll be a net contributor um, through solar panel to the grid. So, so I think they'll get it right. But that's the way I, I look at this. Right. So net, so the net zero target by 24, which you mentioned, that has obviously led to the net zero oceanographic capability 
or Enzoc, and we'll call it Enzoc from now, so we don't have to read all that out. But are you able to introduce us to that in terms of what what that how that contributes to that that aim of being net zero by twenty forty? Yeah, of course, I'll give it a go. Um, so um, NERC baselined its carbon emissions in 2017, 2018. Uh, there was about 50,000 tonnes annually. Um, of that total, the three research ships that NERC operates, the Sir David Attenborough, the Discovery and the James Cook, they are, depending on the activity in a given year and, and, and other stuff that's going on, contributing between sort of 65 and 70 percent of that total so they're a major component um, of that um, but I think NERC recognized that those three research ships are the are the backbone for polar and, and uh, marine oceanography and during this period this this climate crisis period the the science that's being done in those two areas is so important you can't stop it you know it's it's, it's really important um so um how do you then allow the scientists to still collect the data they need but get behind that UKRI sustainability strategy? So uh, NOC led a study, a scoping review a few years ago, um, and that looked at what technology might be available. How would you use that technology? How would you bring that in? How would that change the way you do the science? Uh, and, and they published that scoping review um, and NERC took that review and said, okay, right, we recognize this is a challenge. We've looked at some of the recommendations you made and we think that's you know the right direction of travel. So we'll we'll give this a go. And and out of that has come the NZOC program, uh, which will now seek to work with industry, work with other institutes, uh, uh, encourage development, uh, work with the science community about how do you start to use this new capability. And and over the next decade seek to develop build up the capability scale it up so that it can uh, operate in a way that's uh, appropriate uh, and then work with the community to say right let's do the experiments in a slightly different way let's get the data you need um, but, but there are real opportunities in that capability as well which you know we might get into yeah so in terms of the infrastructure as you mentioned the research ships how will the infrastructure change over time to, to go towards that 2040 target how will NZOC help transition that to be net zero by 2040 or at least contribute to that yeah of course right so so key point number one um uh research vessels like the slave of like the the james cook like the discovery will be part of that infrastructure in 2040 and beyond because they're they play such an important role they're such an amazing uh, uh amazingly capable platforms for doing um oceanography um but the fuel that they will use, whether that's ammonia, whether that's uh, hydrogen fuel cells, whatever it is, is less energy dense than fossil fuels. So we often talk about discovery in its current form, which uses marine gas oil. About 13% of the volume of that ship is, is MGO, marine gas oil. Um, if you replace that with something like ammonia or hydrogen fuel cells, you've got to take about 40 to 45% of that ship by volume. So you're taking up more of the, the, the space on the ship, which means you've probably got to lose some bunks. Currently, those ships can, can take between 50 and, and, and 70 people. Um, and you've got to um, take some of the capability off, some of the labs that you've got on board, some of the equipment that, that, that it's got. So that's key point number one. The ships will still be there, but if you want to maintain their endurance and keep them about the same size, that, then, then you've got to take some of that capability and some of those people off. Right, how do you do that and, and, and um, still ensure you can make the observations you want to make? You bring in autonomy. And so you kind of wrap around uh, the, the autonomy. But actually, once you start to think about this in more detail, you, 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 you look at what is the actual role the research ships will play. You start thinking of them as a platform rather than a ship. And you've got lots of platforms. And each platform now starts to play a role within this this different ecosystem that we're going to use. It will almost certainly be very, very interlinked. Um, uh, and there's a concept, you know, where you've got the research ships as motherships for this, this autonomy that's going out. But, but, but also the autonomy will be shore launched. Uh, it can be operated from, from other vessels, but all still linked and all still interacting uh, in the way you need. And, and so that planning process and that um, working out how to do it is actually one of the 
the first things we're looking at with Enzoc. Uh, and we're starting to bring in AI type thinking because programming all these little bits so that you know which sensors go on which platforms to support which science uh, and which observations you're trying to make becomes pretty complicated pretty quickly. But AI offers a solution where the computer can say, here's a 94% efficient solution. That's what we think yeah. you should So do. is it like taking some of the, so obviously at the moment the research ship will go out and do all the science mostly on the ship is it the, the main thing is sort of taking some of the science off the ship and into the oceans through the autonomous vehicles that's right and and then what you start to 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 um allow yourself to um, uh, imagine it is what are the benefits of this autonomy and um the ships are limited primarily by fuel and food and to a certain extent how long people want to be away at sea 50 days can be quite a lot of time for, for people to be away. So the ships tend to go out, do a bunch of stuff, take a bunch of readings, and then come back. Now autonomy can stay out there for three, four, seven, nine, twelve 12 months. Yeah. Um, you, uh, you know, we're developing platforms that can go across the Atlantic. We've seen uncrewed surface vehicles that can stay out for months at a time, circumnavigate Antarctica, sail through hurricanes, capture data in a way that research vessels can't because you've got the human element and you've got to look after the people so so you can make it safer but you expand the spatial temporal coverage as we say so the the amount of areas that you're covering and the amount of time you can be there and that's hugely um, beneficial to, to a lot of ways of understanding what the ocean's doing so the imperative was to replace fossil fuels on ships you 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 realize that with this increased use of autonomy but now you start to realize the additional benefits of autonomy and bring it all together in this this ecosystem which just operates differently um and uses the new technology and i assume that's going to help collaboration as well so people in from across the world who may not have access to like research ships and be able to go and do that science through this sort of interconnected network of autonomous vehicles it means the sharing of knowledge will be easier as well I mean, again, huge opportunities. So point one, I guess, is the entry costs to doing oceanography have gone from you need 100 million pounds to build a research ship and the infrastructure and the workforce to operate it safely and go and do the science to you can um, uh, do some really interesting experiments with stuff that you can hold in your hand and sensors that, you know, are, are getting close to plug and play. So the entry costs of doing it are, are lowering. Right. How do we start to envision um, that the way we're going to manage this data that's coming out of here and, and certainly there's a move towards saying rather than data that science parties collect being quarantined so that only the science party can see it for a number of years they process it they work out what it means and then they publish their papers all of the data will go into a data portal and everyone will be able to access it straight away and that's the model that that um, satellites uh, have, have followed it's the model that the argo programs follow so there's there's precedent there um, and it actually can can really benefit then a, a much wider community um, and then you get into the, the the other bits as well which are important which is um, people who previously were precluded from going to sea which was a fundamental part of being an oceanographer those barriers are coming down as well. And so, so there's lots of bits to this which are really important. But collaboration will be massively important because, uh, again, you, 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 know, you, you can imagine that you're putting this stuff into the water on the west coast of the UK. Uh, it's swimming across the ocean, swimming down and up and around, um, being collected on the other side. They change the batteries, check the sensors are okay, and push them back. And you need these networks so that you can keep this uh, you know, huge number of autonomous vessels swimming around the ocean and collecting the I data. I assume it's also going to allow us to reach bits of the ocean that otherwise would be difficult to reach. Massively. You know, the, these platforms can go down to 6,000 metres. They can swim hundreds of kilometres under ice caps and ice shelves in Antarctica and, and in the North Pole. Um, they are becoming clever enough that they can swim just above the ocean uh, plains. Uh, and capture data there uh, they're, they're you know pretty good already and swimming through complicated canyons and collecting data and and research ships can do a bit of that but actually these can get in closer uh, and and do surveys in a way that the ships can't so again once you make this leap to saying we're going to bring this autonomous capability into play here you start to then explore well what are the additional things you can do 
so you get you get the best of all the worlds and it, and it is really exciting yeah i just wanted to quickly touch so we we one of the previous episodes is with john sidon who has a lot to do with digital twins good bloke knowing well yeah so i, I assume this this will feed into to the idea of the digital twins i assume this will help push that forward a lot more and yeah. it's sort of an interconnected thing like they're quite closely in, intertwined I, I think so i think um digital twins are a really interesting concept um john obviously uh, has done quite a lot to push that forward and, and explore and explain what it means digital twins of the ocean how might they work um my approach to this is digital twins um uh, can allow you to model and understand and 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 um, uh, look at different influences it, it, within a system but you still need to at some point both collect data to feed into that system model and then once the digital twin said well if we poke over here that's going to happen we think actually again go back into that system you're looking at in our case the ocean uh, and, and, and check is that's what's going to happen and again a key point around autonomy is that spatial temporal cover coverage that it will achieve you can you can imagine quite quickly that the digital twin actually becomes part of the where do you want to send these platforms next with what sensors because they're they're collecting data for individual science parties but they're also collecting data which feeds back into that digital twin and and updates it um, gives it greater confidence in what it's doing uh, and then they say and go over there because we think with the digital twin something interesting could be happening now we've, we've we've run through this digital twin and that tells us that down here there could be a thing right now send those robots down there and see if it's actually happening and and it's that concept which is really exciting then because you start to say there may be things where we genuinely are uncovering new things happening in the ocean using that technology so yeah really so the digital twins are going to basically guide the science on where we should be going and things like that obviously if there's gaps in digital twins and you know right this is where we should be going and with the autonomy that can be achievable instead instead of you know when you have to send the ship out and you can't get that using the autonomy is going to help us enable to reach more of the ocean and basically cover off more areas yeah i, I think that's certainly part of the intention and, and when we've workshopped this before that's part of what came out of that which is how does the digital twin start to either uh, inform scientists and say you know you might want to think about this the scientists will then apply their actual knowledge and experience and go yes or no and then how do you you plan those missions and collect that data so yeah really interesting yeah so obviously 2040 is a long way away well it's, it's not that long when you think about it but it feels a long way so the work that's being done now is is for scientists of the future isn't it it's for the people in 2040 and beyond who will actually be using this now so is that kind of a key sort of thing when you're looking at net zero and, and NZOC? Like we're thinking, right, the work we're doing now is obviously kind of isn't for us almost. It's for people. It's for the scientists of the future. Uh, I mean, certainly the way I approach this is um, it's about the next generation, if I can use that phrase. So the next generation of scientists, what you might describe as the early career researchers now, um, they've got a real challenge, but a huge opportunity. And that is that... Um, for the last 50, 100 years, we followed that challenger model of science party on a ship, go to sea, bucket in the water, analyze that. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being slightly flippant and with moorings and floats and, you know, there's more data that um, oceanographers can use now. But, but it's still been an underpinning um, thing. They've got to work out how do we start to use all of this together uh, and, and bring in the concepts like big data and number crunching and everything else. So they've got a real challenge, but massive opportunity potentially. And so constantly engaging with that um, group to say, how would you use it? Think about what you want to do. And, and you know, we're trying to fund some of these demonstrators, give you, give you some money, give you access to some robots. What would you do with this? And, and how would that uh, either compare about against what you'd have done with a ship or do you want to go and explore somewhere which is, is really novel? The other bit then, uh, of course, are the people who are going to develop, maintain, operate um, this stuff. And again, you know, new skills. You've got to build up that capability, train and develop that workforce um, uh, and, and allow them to, to, to support this. And there's a lot of investment going in across defense and industry into uncreated surface vehicles. 
and, and, and underwater robots and all the rest of it. So, so there's a wider bit to this. Oceanography is not you know, in isolation in this. So you can see the workforce you know, moving in and out of these sectors uh, and supporting each other. And, and again, I think you know, if I was 20 now, you know, I'd learn to code properly uh, and, and I'd make sure my electronics were up to scratch. And then I'd start to really explore you know, the, the other bits and pieces because robotics um, uh, and command and control software and that sort of stuff is going to be key. I, you know, and, and, and come and talk to us. Yeah. Come and say, I've got an idea. Yeah. You know, I would do this. And, and that would be amazing because then we go, right, let's try and make that happen. Right. Um, and you don't need to wait for a ship and you don't need to find, you know, the, the significant sums of money to, to use ships. We might be able to do this quicker and more more cheaply. So should we finish on what's happening right now with NZOC? Is there anything you're working on right now to do with that that's helping to fill a gap in the air or is there anything particularly you want to sort of quickly bring up that you'd, you'd be working on now to do with NZOG? Yeah, no, I'll mention a few things which I think are exciting. Um, so I think I've already talked about AI. We're working with the Bass AI Lab um, to say, right, how can we use that technology to uh, initially simulate but also actually then at some point go, right, this is how we're going to program three research ships, 400 gliders, 20 USVs, 40 long range AUVs and, and actually, but also then, and also networking with these partners and, and they're collecting data and how are they doing it and all the rest of it. So that's a really interesting um, program that's that's gonna uh, continue over the next few years. Um, one of the interesting things for me is trying to get to grips with where you might have what we call PIs, multiple PIs, principal investigators who are saying, we want that kit to go over there and, and explore there and we want this one to go over there and we want this to go over there but actually it's quite interesting that we're all in a similar place um, and so we're, we're, we're trying to fund um, and, and support uh, a collective um, uh, series of missions where there are individual PIs collecting data and we're working with the Met Office and, and other institutes on this but they're going to all share the data and, and you start to then get into really interesting things where one of the PIs might say, oh, one of my gliders is broken or one of the sensors on it isn't working. Can you just swim one of yours over and collect a bit? Um, and then what we'll do is we'll swim out with our next one. And, 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 and so you start to go, well, what, so how would this work? And what are the principles and the, the way you prioritize this stuff in the future? So, so that's a, um, a bit that we're doing. And I think that's really interesting. We are working with uh, a program called Biocarbon, which is going to use research ships and go out into the Atlantic Ocean uh, and try and understand that carbon pump um, thing. Uh, and we've said, right, we'll give uh, uh, someone else some money to do this without the ships. And how would you do it? And that will probably end up with um, some autonomous missions, say from Iceland, swimming around and then coming back to the UK. So completely shore launched. Uh, and we'll look at the data sets that they get. The ships might be out there for 30 days, they could be out there for three months, four months. And again, what we'll try and do is start to stimulate that. Look at the different data sets I can get and how does that allow me to understand what's going on in a different way? Is that exciting? For me, it's important to also understand where are the technology gaps? Because the scientists might say, actually, that was not very good. That's not great, but it also allows me to go back in and, and work with the engineers and the developers and go, that wasn't great, guys. We need to, we need to fix this kind of thing. So, so that's going on as well. Uh, and the other thing I'll mention very quickly, which I think is quite interesting, is trying to collect data from the seabed. In the past, we've used research ships and you, you swim over them. We're trying to use uncrewed surface vehicles. So again, you know, very, very, very low carbon footprint. Uh, and these things can go out and stay out there for months at a time and, and suck up this data from these um, uh, sensors at the bottom of the ocean uh, and then bring that all back or even ping that back via satellite. So the scientists get access to that data quicker um, more effectively uh, and we've we've taken out that carbon footprint so there's just a few uh, and we're also hoping to to launch another sensor development program where we're very focused on biogeochemical sensors because that's the next stage that's a really exciting really exciting subject I mean, i'm sure everyone's really looking forward to seeing how it progresses but yeah thank you so much for coming and speaking about that lee thank you for the opportunity to find out more about enzoc visit the links in the description which includes a link to the enzoc website and some educational animations if you're enjoying Into the Blue, make sure to subscribe on your favourite podcast app and follow us on social media so you don't miss out on future episodes. See you soon.